because we stream online, we try and start with closer stuff. I think we're feeling good with that. And, okay. Um, and then, oh, Tracy. I got her. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on this gorgeous, I'm going to say spring day. I'm going to call it. The crocuses are coming up. Um, it is, uh, it, spring felt like it was in the air. And Massachusetts isn't going to throw us any curveballs from here on out. So it's just going to be spring, lovely days. Um, so um, thank you all for coming this evening. We're really looking forward to tonight's um, reading. Thank you for everyone who is joining us um, online as well. Um, we are so excited to host Tracy Kato Kiriyama here at Smith. Um, as we were planning this event, I have to say of all the poets we have invited um, to come to Smith College, Tracy is the one from the outset who um, has wanted to make sure that there was a lot of student involvement and as much engagement with the Smith community as possible, which I really love um, and appreciate um, and just think is really wonderful. So, I mean, toward that end, um, Tracy has just come from a session of tea and coffee um, with students from Melissa Parrish's class. Um, tomorrow, they'll be having lunch with Pan Asians in Action, a st the student group. Um, and then, this is also unprecedented, um, for, as far as I know, for our reading series, but I love it. Um, Tracy requested that we have a Smith College student um, start off tonight with a few poems. Um, so Lyles Rutshauser, oh, I, I practiced, I swear I practiced. Lyles Rutshauser, sort of, yeah, okay. I practiced all day, thank you. <laughs> we'll be here uh, sharing some work in just a minute. Um, and then um, tonight also, Tracy will be introduced by Melissa Parrish's Race and the Long Poem Seminar, students from Melissa's class, and then following Tracy's reading, um, students from Melissa's class will also be in conversation um, with Tracy as well. Um, so we'll start with uh, the reading by Lyles, and then uh, Melissa and um, students from the class will come up and um, talk a little bit about their work and then introduce Tracy. Um, in terms of thanks for tonight, um, I want to start by thanking Floyd Chung. Um, so um, Floyd first brought TKK's work to my attention, um, and um, Floyd is also going to be including Tracy's work um, in the forthcoming, fourth, when will it be released? In May. So a forthcoming anthology in May, um, and the title of that anthology is The Literature of Japanese American Incarceration. Um, Floyd just sent me a sneak peek at the cover. Um, it just looks like a phenomenal book, so we're incredibly excited about that. Um, I want to thank also the Office for Equity and Inclusion uh, as co-sponsors for tonight's event. Um, and then um, Broadside Books, as always, um, will be selling copies of books in the back. Um, I would really encourage you to pick up a copy of this beautiful book. Um, also in the back, this is also unprecedented, I love it though, um, Tracy will be selling t-shirts too, or uh, currently is selling t-shirts. So we have two t-shirts for you to consider purchasing. If you're online, it's going to be a little difficult. Um, poetry by any means, necessary. Um, and also, 
solidarity by any means necessary. So these are also for sale in the back. I love them. Um, and they're also stickers. If you buy a book, you get a free sticker. Um, and Tracy will be signing books after the event right over here. And also, just come by and say hello, too, if you just want to say hi. Um, that would be great. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Um, just a quick uh, up list of upcoming events. Um, this year's Poet in Residence is Smith College alum Jessica Jacobs, um, class of 2001. And Jessica will be reading on March 26th, also at uh, 7 o'clock right here in Weinstein after spring break. Um, and then on April 9th, Nikki Beer will be reading um, with this year's really incredible group of high school uh, poets who um, the winner and finalists of our high school contest for girls. Um, so don't miss any of those readings if you can. Um, and just a last reminder uh, to my English 112 class, um, the QR codes, they'll be posted uh, at some point um, during the uh, conversation with Tracy. And so just make sure before you leave here tonight to scan the QR codes. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Lila Ruchishauser. Um, a, Lila is a senior here at Smith College, concentrating in poetry with a major in cognitive science and a minor in dance. They have worked for both Field Studio and with Brooklyn Poets. They are delighted and honored to read their work alongside of Tracy. Please welcome Lyles. Hi, I'm nowhere near as tall as Matt. Is this good? Great. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Tracy, for requesting a student speaker, um, and SJ, and M, and everyone at the Poetry Center. So, uh, this is Genesis 6 9 to 8 14, rewritten. For R. Litter scatters through my carpet like loose bullets, my cat in a crescent curled snooze. And you careening back from New Orleans, where your brother's bachelor party featured beignets, po' boys, football, cocaine, strip clubs, men who slung their flesh and cash at women like jackals at war, and violence and violence, and someone shot eight times outside. Yellow ticker tape trailing from those men's loafers, shirts a Wall Street white, each of them speaking for someone like me. My nausea makes me girl and always wrong. Pris, I can't stand to hear about it. Man pays 600 for a blowjob and a girlfriend at home. I hold my tongue when I listen like a raven circling wreckage. All my poems these days about sex and silence. Rug fibers like fingers rubbing a red bloom down my back. My ceiling painted with the blankness of a blameless face. Oh God, nothing is holy. But you and I, nesting in each other's chests, we near the line of sublime. The distance between us evaporating sea, a palm promise that when we meet again, your cheek will rest on my hand, the moment small, the stillness inexplicable, like club goers stopping their wasted writhing all at once to watch a sparrow, soft and unbothered, perch between the strobes. Thank you. Uh, and this next one and last one, under five minutes, um, <laughs> is called Because I Was 15 and He Would Not Look at Me. The boy could have been anyone, but he had curly hair and a damn good voice. He sparked into a room like a cigarette at a gas station. He was meaningful. He meant to mean beautifully in the way that beauty derives from hurt in the way that pain is said to embolden art. His large ears were Van Gogh's in the making, and he loved them for it. He kissed me with too much tongue. He spoke like his wet mouth held the world, and God, how I wanted to be like that, to mean something. Being with him, I realized how alone I was, had always been and became in that moment more singularly defined by another person than I have ever let myself be since. I would have done anything to feel like he could love me, so I did. Do you understand me? Fearing the fall with its compulsion toward catastrophe, I charged into winter, which is to say that the hands he used were really mine, but large and sweaty 
and grabbing. Recently, I've tried to write about Medusa, a poem of a sculpture, of a painting, of a name. This is how I abstract her, like so many have, picking out only parts of her I want to see, calling myself snake, but rarely woman. It is tempting to be vicious, to act aggressor. In my own mythology, I act, I slash. My body turned gorgon, never shudders like an incompetent ghost, no. I collide into the jaw of the world sideways. I don't repeat stories. I have never been stuck. I bear myself on a castle of yes. I am a bullet god. No one can look away. Thank you. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Melissa Parrish. I teach in the English department and I'm here with Mila Winnick and Mary-Kate Wilson who will be giving the introduction for Tracy tonight. I'm gonna start just by telling you a little bit about our seminar. Uh, our seminar is called Race and the Long Poem and it considers how experimental poems trouble the all too often invisible cultural codes of race, grammar and sexuality influenced by US empire. So when I learned that the Poetry Center, in collaboration with the Office of Equity and Inclusion, would be bringing Tracy Kato Kiriyama here to Smith, I knew that we would have a wonderful opportunity to hear from an incredible poet and organizer firsthand about their experiences, their art, and their activism in conversation with these same course themes. Even more importantly, um, Matt Donovan and Jen Blackburn generously invited our class to be in conversation with Tracy and Tracy encouraged us to make this event as student-centered as possible, and I'm so grateful to all of you for helping us make that happen. Um, thank you for this opportunity to bring what might otherwise be a purely classroom conversation into the room here with all of you today. Uh, finally, I'm grateful to the seven incredible students in this course who have been really focused and intentional about how they want to introduce Tracy's work. They've got some incredible questions and conversations they want to have with Tracy and they've got some really thoughtful subjects they wanna bring into conversation with all of you tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mila and Mary-Kate. Thank you, Mila and Mary-Kate, who will introduce Tracy. Uh, after Tracy's reading, we'll be followed by Q&A with, em with Emily Buck, Braley Netto, and Maya Penuel. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mila. And my name is Mary Kate. And we represent English 318, Race in the Long Poem. We're very excited tonight to introduce you to community organizer, artivist, and inter slash transdisciplinary poet, Tracy Kato Kiriyama. Navigating Without Instruments by Tracy Kato Kiriyama appears to open at the scene of a disaster. The collection cautions the reader, declaring, warning, a book of poetry is a trigger Warning, a book of poetry is a trigger. The text repeats six times, confusing what exactly is a warning, the book itself, poetry, and what is a call to action. Next, TKK offers the first instance of the book's visual motif, a folded military emergency blanket, depicting symbols of distress and survival. The first message reads, have abandoned plane, walking in this direction. The folded blanket Blanket Edge directs the reader to turn the page. If you follow this guidance, you are led to a vulnerable exploration of grief, community, and time, where TKK explores memory through multiple generations of the Japanese American community, and consciously, as they say, co-creates a space of self-determination across friends, family, and time. As they progress, what first appeared to be the aftermath of a disaster becomes a present day exploration of survival and continued historical interconnectedness. TKK shows us the necessity of looking beyond disaster as a concept situated in the distant past, instead exploring how communities resist ongoing disaster. Amidst systemic oppression, violence, and intergenerational trauma, Kato Kiriyama orients their poetry around curiosity. Which pasts must be reconciled? What is necessary for survival? And finally, what sort of change can we imagine in these spaces of self-determination? 
However, TKK is not merely concerned with their own survival or with a single community on its own, but also with the coalitions and overlaps that allow us to share strategies for both survival and also joy. Reworking everything from our grandfather's memories of internment to quotes from friends and community members, TKK creates a book of poetry that embraces, embraces hybrid genres and sources of knowledge. As the title, Navigating Without Instruments, suggests, this openness turns poetry into a loose guidebook that many of us can bring home to our own communities. She extends an invitation for all of us to use the map that she charts, guiding us along a map, a path that winds through historical remembering, personal healing, and coalition building. This practice of reaching inwards to the self, outwards to the reader, and beyond the physical book becomes concrete in the notes that Kato Kiriyama includes throughout Navigating Without Instruments. These notes, which designate sections of poems as notes to self, to the reader, to the world, and to specific audiences like the Asian American artist community, welcome us into the active practice of reading as a collective. We're so excited to see how TKK's reading tonight animates this practice even further, especially as we respond to their words as an audience. We also want to acknowledge that an essential part of our positionality as an audience is that we're on uh, Pukumtuk, Nanatuk, and Nipmuc land. We ask that throughout tonight's discussions about political action and historical healing, we all keep in mind that upholding these political practices necessitates a continued commitment to decolonization and an understanding that as TKK discusses the ongoing of violence of history, this is a practical call to action and not simply an abstract concept. Finally, to welcome TKK tonight, we've prepared a few notes of our own. So first, note to Smith, TKK comes to us from unceded Tongva land in the South Bay of Los Angeles, where they are writer, performer, storyteller, educator, and activist. Their work has been circulated in an impressive number of both print publications and presentation spaces. She grounds her focus in community organizing and healing, working as a founding member of the Okere Nike LGBTQ network and organizer for the National Nike Rep Reparations Coalition and the director of the Tuesday Night Project, which is the longest running Asian American public art series in the United States. We're so very lucky to have them with us tonight. And note to TKK, thank you for joining us here. We are honored to learn from you tonight at Smith, and we can't wait to discuss this wonderful book of poetry and your work beyond the page. We are excited to unleash, unearth, unwind, and unbury with you. And finally, note to all, let's welcome our guests with a round of applause. That is just about one of the best, most thoughtful and well-written introductions I've ever had in my entire life. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm being totally serious. Can we please give a huge round of applause? Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I want a copy of that. Um, uh, hello, folks. Can you hear me okay? I like to get right up in the mic, so if, do, sh can we, can we give a hand to our, our tech folks in the back? Because sound people, video people are the gods of, the, of what's going to happen. So um, thank you so much for, for having me. It's such a privilege to be here. Um, I come up from a land we talked about, uh, Tongva land. But it's also land um, that I want to further acknowledge is shared by Chumash folks, the Gabrielino community. Uh, we have many, many communities, and we are also uh, connected through our water sources. So that takes us all the way up north in California to the Kutsudika tribe uh, beyond Mono Lake and the, uh, Pai, the land of the Paihunaru near Lone Pine, which is near uh, the community that my, yeah, I'll call it a community. My, my, our families made it a community, but it was an American concentration camp called Manzanar. Um, so we uh, give a lot of respect and love and honor to the folks who are gaining a lot of land back in that area and uh, primarily the, um, the Paiute folks. So we're excited to actually break bread and visit with them this April to learn more about the advancements that they're making in, in gaining land back. And as one of the persons who was quoted um, in one of the efforts recently uh, who... Uh, 
was the title holder. Um, she calls it a land forward uh, initiative for herself, right, as somebody who um, occupied that land. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to do a time check, because I, I know that I get to read for about 30 or 35 minutes or so. Um, is, that, is that about right? OK, so I'm going to keep an eye on that. Um, So um, this book, I think some of you in the room are familiar with, others are not. It's called Navigating Without Instruments. There's three ways, ways to read it, actually. Navigating Without Instruments, Navigating With Instruments, Navigating Without Instruments. I'll let you just kind of let that marinate in your heads while we do this reading. Um, So I do like to start with the first page, which is warning, a book of poetry is a trigger 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 warning. And yeah, you talked about the icons. Um, I'm so happy to share about that. Um, there are 12 sections to this book. And they are divided uh, in, by 12 icons that were made available to the public through a survival guide that was written in the 40s and 50s. And these books were written specifically by the Army and Air Forces. And I've, um, I think a child, as we all really are, we're all children of war, um, descendants of war. Uh, in the spaces that that occupies and the ways that that divides our families. I've always been very interested in military history and world history as it relates to people and, uh, and power. Um, so when I stumbled upon the survival guides that was in a military museum in San Diego, California, I became really mesmerized and eventually pretty obsessed. So I actively collect survival guides from these time periods. Um, I, I collect them all the way up until today, but they're a lot less interesting today. Um, the ones from the 40s and 50s are, are, are wild. You have to check them out yourself. Um, and uh, they really, they, they go beyond sort of practical information, but you know, they're talking about entering into so-called like native lands and, and uh, dealing with people in the jungle. It's, it's really a fascinating read. I encourage you to look for some of these, or you can contact me and I can guide you to some of these pages. But in particular, when I saw these icons way back when, um, this is probably one of, besides the title, one of the only things that I knew I wanted to keep um, or use. In, in an eventual book of poetry. And uh, the idea was that there were these yellow and blue placards, or they could be blankets. And depending on how you folded it, it would supply a different message. So this is the only image that you would see, obviously, no words under it. And so, yes, this one begins, have abandoned plane walking in this direction. Remember all the children whom were never born to me. The little raspy voice one who can name all the presidents. The big haired one with a smile that screams for revolution and popsicles. The squeaky retort and gentle foot one I saw while sitting there at the beach. Every little one I see while sitting anywhere at every awful beach. Versions of a future, a given back in my 20s. All the while, I said my window was closing, but I still knew I had time. This was supposed to happen, after all. All or any of them. Especially the ones who came to me in my dreams. The curly-haired cutie pie, who rounded the corner off the hallway to up and fly into my arms. I still catch him sometimes while standing here frozen in my kitchen. Or the goofball, who tapped me on the forehead too early in the morning begging for waffles and presents. I still see them, even after the decorations are taken down. They construct the perfect, imperfect child. Some tiny one, I imagined, would be both 
of my body and dropped off at my door at their age of two, ready to go, ready to walk, ready to use the toilet on their own. My fantasies don't need to struggle. That little one who would frustrate me, send me to fits, challenge me to the point of knowing I was getting mine. The growing one who would be aging alongside me feels like they should be, would have been here by now. Redream, curly-haired cutie pie. He was a little he, big curly hair, mixed blood of my blood or not. Maybe four or five when he sped down the hall around the corner of the kitchen, open arms toward me, running jump to fly into a future memory passed right by me. That is all I know, or is it all I can remember? But he was mine as much as any little one could be. Maybe there's more to recall. He had a big laugh like mine and a grand smile. As he grew older and older, he became queerer and queerer, bigger and tougher, and he determined to keep his smile. And we never warred, and we always debated. And we spent less time together, and we loved each other like I could never love any other, or is that just what is said happens when a child enters into your life to blossom your adulthood? Of course, well, of course. And one day, he went to a grave and placed a single cymbidium on a patch of land no one else was left to care to visit. He planted a joke into the earth underneath his knees and swore to the birch tree above his head that the grounds of the cemetery shook because of the chattering set of teeth buried below. That is my mother cracking up, he said. I swear I can hear her laugh penetrate the wind. Then he rose to his feet and left me alone again. Note to community. Please do not assume so much of the person walking this earth at this time without child, that there has been a simple path of deciding against adopting or bearing child, even when you meet them at the moment of being at peace with not adopting or bearing child, that there hasn't been loss, contemplation, depletion, letting go, debate, fighting with self or partner, that there has only been loss, depletion, fighting with self or partner, that there hasn't been the extreme depths of unbelievable love, joy, passion, peace, exploration, creation, that there hasn't been birthing. Instead, invite us in. We can be revolutionary aunties and radical siblings, and you could probably use the support. Note to reader, write a letter to your future great-great-grandchild whether real or imaginary, whether you ever wanted a child or not. The letter must include three questions to yourself, then to the child. Mail it to someone you trust, or read it aloud once, then bury it. When I was first touring with this book, I didn't actually read that first section much when I was at uh, college campuses. I think I made an assumption that uh, people wouldn't relate at all because you're too young to be thinking about having children. But I remember myself when I was 19, 20 years old, um, never uh, understood or wanted the pressure from society or my parents about having children. And yet at a core personal level, I thought I would have one. I thought I would have fun. Being a parent, I thought I would be a really good, strict one. To this day, I'm like, oh, I would not let them have phones. <laughs> they would not have a tablet at the age of seven. <laughs> and uh, I realize more and more as I travel with this book, how really this is, um, as most sections in this uh, book, uh, I think a core theme for me is assumption. One of my greatest pet peeves is assumption. And I've had so many conversations over time with people from even high school who obviously have thought about family and legacy and generations because of where they come from and how they live now. 
I've also had so many conversations with folks who make assumptions about what we should be doing with our bodies. And uh, that last section, the note to community about don't assume, uh, especially came up after a friend of mine who never wanted to be a father, then became a father, took me aside at a public event for an hour and told me um, how I was being selfish for not having a child. How I really would never truly understand art. Right? Uh. <laughs> I was like, okay, buddy, and then I went home and wrote. <laughs> so you just never know what a person is actually going through, right? Their identities, whether obvious or not, nothing is obvious, right? Um, okay. All right. How's everyone? You good? Breathe, breathe, breathe. I'm telling that to myself. Okay. So um, do folks remember the tragedy that happened um, at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando in 2016? Yeah. It was a gay nightclub. Lots of Latinx folks. The shooter was deemed Muslim, right? It's a very complicated intersection of things happening there. Um, this is uh, after the victims and survivors of the June 12, 2016 tragedy at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Somewhere between Orlando and a biopsy. My left breast goes into a hole center of a long table. I think that is odd. Why is the hole in the center? I lay down on my stomach to position myself at the table's midsection. The vice comes in and the nurse's hand tugs and pulls and we converse anyway. There is a doctor coming soon named Needle. Hello, Needle. Hurry up, I will say. The nurse will pat my back at its center and ask me what I do for a living. This is always the tricky part between strangers. Keep it light or keep it real. Tell her everything. Cut to the chase. What do I have to lose? We will be there for 40 minutes. She will have my left breast in her right hand for most of it. Enough time for honesty and judgment without the sting of attachment. If what I say centers around her discomfort, then she will still have my left breast in a vice and we will be even. I tell her everything. I cut to the chase. I have nothing to lose. I speak in lean terms. I center on my truths. Me as queer. Me with mind split between yesterday's shooting and tonight's vigil. Me in vigilance for the dead as much as for those left running for cover in the days, weeks, and years of backlash. Me in love and solidarity with my family of queer folk, Muslim community, our immigrant families, and the list continues. My politics are not shy. My words attempt to carve an avenue on this cold biopsy table. She looks me in the eye. She listens and nods. A map emerges between us. She says she wishes she could join me. There is work and life and no time, and she tells me, you go to this vigil for me, too. I wish I could nod back, but I can't move from the center. Instead, I moan. She understands that language much better than I do. She speaks in possibility and kindness and grabs my hand. Within minutes, I chart her origins. We locate an old dream of hers once a painter. Within minutes, she navigates my politics and my relations. She nods as I moan and I squeeze her fingers. My half-numb breast is stuck in a vise with a needle at its center, and all is good, and I am fine. Yay for nurses who are awesome. Nurses are awesome. That's the bottom line. But when they're um, people who have so much compassion uh, for all kinds of life, 
no matter how they identify, it's like another level. Um, okay, I'm gonna do this one really quick. So a week later, um, so, so we were, a bunch of us planning a vigil for, for LA that night, and uh, I was not ready for what a biopsy is. It's like medieval, y'all. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's uh, interesting, these machines and methods that were created obviously decades ago and have not been updated for reasons of greed and capitalism, just like it's that, <laughs> it's that simple. And, um, and so we have these archaic uh, procedures still. And I was on my back with an ice pack on my boob, and I was still like, uh, you know, organizing people to the vigil on text. And I was like, yeah, I'll make it. I just need to leave by 4.30. And my partner Joyce was just like looking at me in pain, lying on my back, on my phone, with an ice pack on my chest. And, and she just said, can you pause for a second? Like, how are you feeling right now? Can you just listen to your body? And that's been, I think, a theme of our relationship. Um, her being my rock, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we were still holding this weird question of what this biopsy was gonna show, and so this is from a week later. Week of diagnosis, day one. The things a doctor should never say. A doctor really shouldn't do what she did. A doctor should enter the room calmly. A doctor should stay in the room once she's opened my file instead of rushing in and out. A doctor should look like she knows what she's doing if only for the sake of the patient and the patient's partner who is now frozen in place because the doctor can't just say the word. A doctor should not begin by saying, this is so hard, I don't know how to say this, you're so young. A doctor should begin with, I don't want you to worry, you will be fine. There is amazing technology now and we will fight this so hard it never comes back. I take Joycey's hand and tell her not to worry. I look my doctor in the eye and say, it's okay, just say it, if anything, a doctor should just say it, because I can't, not yet. The doctor must go first. So, ended up being breast cancer, and uh, with the help of family and family that I call community, community that I call family, uh, we were able to, you know, kick its ass. It's totally gone, we're all good. Um, yeah, we're all going through so many things, right? And we all know people who are um, sitting with illness. We all know people who we don't even realize are sitting with illness or are caretaking for people who are sitting with illness. So again, this theme of like assumption keeps coming up for me. Um, there are, like I said, 12 different sections in this book. There are many themes. Uh, I know that I wanted a collection that would speak to the kinds of conversations that I would wanna have once the book came out. And um, at the same time that I was writing this project, I was working on a play called Tales of Clamor. And this particular section I'm gonna read from helped me to understand my character in that play. I needed to understand, I was really able very clearly to understand the motivations of the characters of the course and, and my partner, my stage partner, Kennedy. And I had the hardest time with my character, my representational character um, of myself, to really hone in on what her motivation was. And I realized in uh, writing through this section of the book how it's, um, it comes down to my family. It comes down to being a descendant, being a grandchild of someone who didn't get to see justice after being put away in an American concentration camp, um, who died before the redress movement. How many of you heard of Japanese American redress, that there was a fight for reparations and redress, right? And I don't know if you know, many of us in the Japanese American community are uh, very active, very, very actively involved in various solidarity um, movements uh, for reparations now, for black reparations, for land back, for the comfort women, um, and, and I think that there's a tie that's just uh, very direct in some ways. 
on top of knowing that it's owed and possible and overdue, right? So this is for my grandfather. So this is dedicated to all the ancestors who have died before knowing that redress and reparations would be a thing to come or to be fought for in the future we call now. I'm actually going to take a sip of water. <laughs> <clears throat> no redress, no museum, no monument, no poem, no song can house the spirit of a past soul like that of my grandfather who died before justice could meet the old man at his mailbox. Grandpa never got to stand in line at the bank three inches taller with redress check in hand, one foot in front of the other feeling grounded again never got to deposit an apology in his savings account, never got to wonder of how he might spend this money on new equipment for the nursery or a truck for himself or college money for his grandchildren or for once take the most takai cuts from the fish truck man. Most years in April, I attend pilgrimage. I say hello, Manzanar. I bow at the graves. I speak to the wind of my hopes for afterlife to be a real thing. Not so I can see Grandpa again, but for him to look around today, jump into the circle, dance the tankobushi, and watch me get it right, and see our friends, all our relations, learn what we mean by chosen family. We are here, not only to remember, but to remind the local docents, this place will never be a museum. This body will never forget. And we leave pilgrimage with pledges as concrete as the monument. We sing songs to keep each other awake on the long ride home. We lose sight quickly. Rearview mirrors, a pitch black sky where they close the gate at the hour they have had enough of us, where we leave behind parts of our best poetry, where I hope not, but think Grandpa sits still waiting. <sighs> so this is really usually where I always have to say this. I will not, and I never do, apologize for crying. Um, I cry, I'm a walking waterfall, okay? I call uh, tears just bits of truth surfacing for air. And um, what's the thing, right, when you're in public and you start crying or someone in a public setting cries, and then what's the first thing you hear them say right after tears start falling? Sorry, right? So I give us all permission from now on never to do that anymore, okay? Yeah. I know it's hard, but let them tears fall. You know what I mean? Like, um, it's truth. It's your truth. Um, oh my gosh, time is moving. I'm going to move beyond grandparents. Um, you can read the book. You can buy it. <laughs> On the note of storytelling, um, I want to read this for all of you in here. So this is interactive. and. Uh, I'm going to ask you when you hear something uh, that resonates for you to hold your hand and keep your hand up and I'll let you know when you can bring them down. Ready? Okay. Note to community. Are you an artist, a writer, an art maker, a creative? Do you birth scripts, novels, memoir, poetry, short stories, essays, letters, articles, applications, email? Text messages. Better have everybody, come on. All right. Writer or not, as one of your identifiers, we all walk through life with stories, history, experience, memories, ideas, opinions, theories, philosophies, visions, fears, fantasies, dreams. And we'll likely travel through life holding most of these in. At some point, someone thought it was a good idea to make record of their story or a community, community's narrative. And then some of that made it into the books you love. And some of that became the basis for our various canons of literature. And some of that was drawn or animated or graphic novelized. 
And some of that was made into videos, narrative films, documentaries, and some of that was made into music. And some of that became the thread of information we build upon in studies of race, queerness, gender, feminism, war, history, science, technology, and at every turn, someone had some kind of permission that became the opportunity for them to write. Whether that opportunity was an offer to read their writing aloud or publish in a community newspaper or a voice begging from within to be processed on paper in order to extract some deep pain or express some kaleidoscopic vision, they all heeded permission and need. No one will come to write your story for you or thread together the legacy of narratives with which you enter each room. And it doesn't matter whether you call yourself a writer or an artist. What matters lies within the doing. It is in the permission to start. So please, by all means, begin. Or in this case, continue. I know we have a lot of writers in here, right? And no, not every artist gets up at 5 a.m. to start penning. And not every artist writes every damn day. You will find your way. Just dive. Who's working on some poetry these days? OK, OK. All right, several hands. Uh, I can't wait to see it. I really mean it. Um, I want to, within just, I'm hoping maybe I can read Dos Mas. Um, yeah, on assumption, on assumption, this theme is really, think, I'm thinking about this a lot today. Um, I am a part of a community called Okaidi. It's uh, Nikkei, Nikkei is like a diasporic term for out of Japan, so Japanese American, Japanese Brazilian, Japanese Peruvian, right? Um, and so Okaidi is a group that was brought together by Marsha Izumi as a sort of a call to action for Nikkei community to embrace their queer LGBTQIA plus uh, children. She is the mother of a transgender son. And uh, there are now conferences that happen every two years. Um, and it's been going on for the past decade or, or decade plus. Um, and I remember in the very early days of us meeting to discuss this conference, um, we struggled a lot inside the room. Um, we felt there needed to be more queer voices alongside these really super awesome, well-intentioned you know, parents and allies. Um, and so I think that's why I wrote this particular note. And it's N-T-A-O-U-Q. Um, Notes to allies of us queers. I once heard an ally uncle say his fantasy is to host a big hall full of families, wholly present to witness the coming out of their child and that child and an other's child, and just one after the other after the other, like a room of folks testifying and receiving witness, and just a whole bunch of queers coming out in front of every single person in their family said our community would be healed once this happens. <laughs> Ally uncle, maybe that is not for you to say. Coming out isn't always the only way to happiness. There are queers with extremely full lives, full of love and family, chosen and otherwise, and a way of living and being that is healthy and not out in a way that is obvious or verbalized. Please let each queer friend of yours decide for themselves the way they want to be at any given moment with any given family member, blood or not. And don't be surprised if they tell you they are healthy, satisfied, joyous, whole. Yeah, let's do some snaps for Ally Uncle. But he's good. He's cool. He understands. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to end on this piece. Um, I mentioned my, my awesome partner, Joyce, and uh, she always would say, let me, let me, I got where is this piece? Um, she would often say to me when I was working on this book, uh, 
Are you, are you writing a poem about me? You better be writing a poem about me. <laughs> and I was like getting close to the end and I was like, oh, I better really write something. <laughs> I mean, I write to her and about her all the time, but it was like, you know, you can't put everything in and you know. So I, um, I, I worked on this. It was a, a, a thought I, I've had and I, I hold to this day. Of course, it ended up really being about my father. <laughs> Um, who, who had died, who had died in uh, 2005, and, and I always think about this. So it's for her, to him, to her, about him, and them. Anyway, so, where we would have gone. Water. where we would have gone. And then there were those who said it was best I didn't come out to you before you died. Your generation being the rusty sunken treasure chest that it is or so they'd say. But I insist on my ability to predict the past. It would have happened in July. Your dying wish that final year you knew wasn't yours. A trip with all the grandkids, aunties, uncles, cousins, calabash, and by blood, all aboard the biggest ship for the cheapest price, a floating island of humans, midsummer, the worst combination for my sanity. I would have waived my right to a vote, packed my trepidations, and prepared an entirely new way of breathing. All eyes would be on the space between you and my girlfriend. But despite all assumptions, you would be just fine. Because the summer before, sitting down for lunch that should have been hamburgers or tacos or anything you wanted, me hunched underneath another failed relationship, the warning of others I'd made the wrong choice again. There I was trying to defend, promise I will be fine. I promise I know what I'm doing. All you knew was to leap from your chair. Forget the pockmarked liver tethering you to your seat. Put your hand on my shoulder. Make everyone else turn to vapor. Say one thing to me. You okay, kid? I just want you to be okay. And it would have happened, and it would happen on the deck of a ship at the end of two behemoth weeks, enough time for you to witness Joycey being to you the way she is with the rest of the world, the earth and air to my fire and water, the attentive observer who never calls for attention. I would pretend never to catch you catching this. And come the sunset of our trip, after wave upon wave of sticky toddlers, sopping wet miniature cargo shorts, stomping alongside sloppy drunk men children, expertise gained of every open bar available before 3 p.m., and the mastering of overwhelm by every buffet, the better part of me slumped in my designated chaise lounge barely the gumption to lift my neck in time to see you, standing at the edge of the deck, pressing your midsection against the rail, pretending you didn't need painkillers. Joycey would walk over, ask, how you doing, George? You would put your hand on her shoulder. I'm okay, kid. I'm doing okay. And there, would never be a better thing said, never a better time had. Thank you so much for this honor to read with you. Thank you so, so much. Excited for conversation. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that. I think I speak for everyone when I say that was amazing. Um, so I guess I'm just going to dive right in with our first question. Um, you mentioned in a previous reading that it took you eight years to complete this book. So I'm very curious about your writing process during that time and what about those eight years was so important for you. Um, hi again. Um, yeah, eight years. That's a long time. Woo! Um, I, I did a lot of running away from it. There were entire seasons and in a couple of cases, like, yeah, a year and a half there that I didn't touch it. Uh, I threw out <laughs> pieces constantly, like what it is now doesn't look anything like what it was in the beginning. I think the only thing I really held on to was like the title and those icons. And so much had to be saved for another time or never. Um, and then, you know, I got cancer in the middle there. Um, my publisher had told me uh, a couple things. Uh, earlier on when I was working on it and I was starting to face some really like hard uh, stories and memories that I wanted to dive into. Um, in particular, there was a time where my mom was suffering a lot and it's interesting because I feel like safer to say that now, now that she has dementia. It's so weird. Because um, I want to be protective of her. And uh, so there were certain things that were merging in terms of what was both our story. And for her as my mother and me caring for her during a really difficult period that lasted quite a while. And there was um, depression and ideation and the revealing of certain things that she had never revealed to anyone in her life. And thing, certain things that I almost thought, I'm not sure if you should be telling me this. But it's OK, you should tell me this, because you're not telling anyone else. Um, so I think I, I just started to, to have a, a hard time, right? Writing is hard. Writing is hard. I think poetry forces us, allows us, gives us permission to, um, begs us to, asks us to be honest um, and be revealing. I, I don't often write in the abstract. I, I do dive into that sometimes because it's, it's in a way an escape. <laughs> but I try to be pretty like raw and straightforward. I, I have readers who don't usually read poetry. And I do think about that. And um, so I think um, the eight years was a lot of that, dealing with those things. And, and something that I shared when we chatted earlier, there was a, there's a playwright. His name is Philip Kangotanda. And um, I didn't get this directly from him. It was through a friend, a mutual friend. And Philip once said, write what it is you need to say or you will die if you don't. Write what it is you need to say or you will die if you don't. And I'm always usually working on many things at once. And this was obviously uh, alongside a play um, that I had mentioned, uh, one of the biggest projects that I was working on at the time. And not for any other project or any other thing I was working on, but for this book, when I heard that quote, I knew that was the theme, the bar, kind of the, the, the call for this project. I wanted to kind of reveal and dive into all of these memories, hard, joyous, heartbreaking, whatever, um, because I knew it would be a way that I could, one, face it, let it out, and then have conversations with it. Because I don't ever think that um, any of these themes or stories are special. They're unique. We all are unique. I don't think we're particularly special. Does that make sense? I don't want to hurt your feelings, but um, <laughs> I only say that because I mean, we're, we're actually really connected. We're actually really connected in a lot of the things that we go through, even though they're very distinct and different. We go through human uh, emotions, uh, loss, right? And death and, and different things. And so, um, even if we have a very distinct, specific story, it, the, the, the sort of underlying kernel 
of, of what we're writing for and how we're trying to survive through a memory um, connects us with other people. So, um, so yeah, I ended up being like, okay, yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that's sort of the measure. Like, am I gonna put something in? Does it, does it measure to that? <laughs> um, or does that belong somewhere else? Um, and so, as I was facing particularly things about my mom, I was starting to have uh, conversations with her. And oftentimes in my uh, many years of creating work, I have, she's been one of my muses. And she always knew that. And so when I would get closer to the end of a project or a piece or something that was going to come out, I would have a conversation with my mom and just kind of warn her. <laughs> or if I was in the process, I'd be asking her for questions, clarification, information, history, and permission. And she'd always say the same thing. Oh, yeah, you should write about this. My life is crazy. Or, you know, uh, nothing you do surprises me anymore. Yeah. So as I was getting towards certain things that were coming to fruition for, for my mom and, and this book, I was like, oh, I better have that conversation again. So it was around my birthday, and, and we were chatting, and um, I brought it up. And she said, yeah, you, you, you can write about anything, just don't write about me. And I was like, <gasps> like, I really, like, it really took the wind out of me. I really was not <laughs> expecting that. Like, I was 25 years worth of not expecting that. And, um, by three months later, I had carpal tunnel in my elbow and my wrist, and I couldn't type. And I work with a Reiki master, and, and Jacqueline said, like, you know, tell me what's been going on. And I, I told her about that, that, that moment. And she's like, that's exactly what's happening. You know, it's all stuck, right? Um, so it was things like that, <laughs> lots of psychological blocks. And then there's also the layers of reality of life. Um, I work in many different uh, mediums, and I love my work, and I do a lot of community organizing, too. I love my community work. I love, I hate saying no, you know? And so there's that, too, right? It's like I, I, I couldn't, and I didn't want to, actually, just like leave everything aside and go write for six months. Um, it's just not the kind of writer I am, which is why I think I felt compelled to say a little bit about encouraging people to think about writing no matter what you call yourself. Because the only assumption, on assumption, the theme of assumption, the only assumption I can make walking into any room is that every single seat here that is occupied, you're bringing in a legacy of stories. You're bringing your whole life's experience and all the things, yeah, that you think and dream about and have ideas around. And there's no way someone else is going to write that, right? But, but you. So I really, I mean it. Who gives it if you call yourself artist or, or writer? Or who cares what your major is? You know what I mean? I'm going to give you a prompt right now for, for, to take for, to, to, for later. Just if everyone could write a letter to your future self. Let's start there. Write a letter to your future self. And at the end of it, you'll make three pledges. Well, the letter must include questions. I'm a big letter writer, I should say. <laughs> and I'm trying to get more people to write letters. And um, if you write to me, I'm going to put this challenge out there. If you write me a letter, so if you have a professor in here who's somehow connected to me now, um, I'll give you a secure mailing address, and you could write me a letter. If you write me a real letter, not a note in a card, a real letter, I'll, I'll send you a book, okay? And I'll write you back, I promise. I, I can say this because very few people take me up on it. More and more people are taking me up on it, so I, I have a little bit of a backlog, but I swear I will get to it. At the end of your letter, you're gonna make three pledges. Pledge to self, pledge to community, and pledge to world however you define any of those things. That's a long-winded answer to your question. But yeah, eight years. Thank you for that answer. Um, and I wanted to talk about, um, I feel like in the poems that you read, you read No Redress um, and where we would have gone. You just talked a little bit about letter writing. Um, and you know your theater background. <laughs> um, 
And what so something that comes up for me a lot is like this work of imagination um, and this like creation of something like hypothetical or new or completely out of the realm of what has actually happened. And I wonder how that figures into your work with this very real work with memory and with what's been passed down generationally and what you're doing in this book. That's a big and great question. I love that. Imagination to me is permission. You know, like, uh, and it's also a way of processing through grief and memory, which is the same to me. <laughs> and um, I think also as like activists and community organizers, right, we're, we're called to constantly reimagine and imagine anew um, things that we hope to see. Uh, the dismantling of systems that we want to break down, right? Um, the ways in which we want to challenge our own selves to think about what we mean by anything that seems benevolent, like land, which is actually not benevolent at all, right? It's not, it's not uh, anything small. Um, so I, I think imagination, for me, yeah, it really does boil down to permission. It's like, a, I like fantasy, I like dreaming. Um, and so not, why not write into that? It, it comes for a reason. There, there's a, readings by Black Elk, Black Elk Speaks. That's a suggestion I would have for all of us to read or reread. Um, Black Elk talks about dreams and how we need to heed our dreams. They would create dances from their dreams. Um, the, the Lakota people take dreams very seriously, right? Our indigenous elders tell us, our indigenous community friends tell us constantly how seriously dreams need to be heeded. Um, they may seem like really, do you have really crazy dreams sometimes, <laughs> right? Like those are the ones that we should write down. Um, and then, and then the, in the mundane, the, the, the heartbreaking, the, the nightmares, too. There's so many kernels in there. Does that, is that in the realm of what you're talking about when you say imagination, or you? It was a very open-ended question, <laughs> so I appreciate your answer. OK, yeah. I mean, Thank we you. could go on and on, but yeah. Like, why not? I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? That, that's exactly what we hit the, the, the recess ground running with when we're four is just pure permission for imagination to happen for 20 minutes, right? And we can make up anything. We're like on spaceships. I had spaceships with gummy bears and like whatever clothes I wanted to wear all the time. That was like my, that's how I began the day, right? So to dive into that, to always dive into that, yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier, like, grief and memory, and I think this question ties into that. Um, one thing that, like, stands out throughout your book is um, the death moments, which is your name for near-death experiences. And one of the scholars that we read for our class writes that death moments give shape to the memory work you embark on in the book. Um, how do you see these death moments as important or integral to memory and activism? Whoa. Can you repeat just that last part? How do yeah, I see yeah, death totally. moments as integral? Yeah, how do you see these death moments as important or integral to memory and activism? Oof, I wanna answer that in like a million ways. Um, ugh. Ah, that's a great question. Ooh, you'll have to send me these later. Um, I think one of the reasons why I have these tears emerging at the moment is because as soon as you said that, I thought about Jim Matsuoka. So Jim Matsuoka um, died about a year, oh my gosh, about a year and a half ago. He was a longtime organizer with a group called NCRR, uh, Nikkei for Civil Rights and Redress. 
And to his dying day, he was calling out for all kinds of calls to action um, in solidarity um, with many movements and many initiatives. And um, you know, I think about Yuri Kochiyama. I think about so many people that I've had the honor of meeting uh, or working with and um, or learning from always. And I always feel like they're sort of, I have a little altar. I have two altars in my, my little bookcase in back of my desk. And uh, so I see, I see the pictures of, I see these faces often of people who have died. And it, it's along, right there alongside, but like my, my bacha and my grandpa, you know, uh, my dad, my uncles. And um, my last, so Kato Kiriyama, that's my, that's my mom's side and my dad's side. And so we just lost the last Kiriyama on my dad's side, my last uncle. And I have just on the Kato side, my mom, and then her, her one brother left. And so it's, it's, it's interesting, like, uh, the ways in which I think about all these people who have passed, who've done so much. And I hope they don't feel, or I hope they didn't feel in their last days that they were forgotten because whether they're like a big name like Yuri Kuchiyama or someone like, you know, a, another name that maybe didn't feel that, um, that I feel like there are driving forces. I think that when I think about death moments, I wrote about mostly my own. One was in Witness 2, but those were my death moments. I like talking about death. I love it. Oh, God, that sounds so weird. But uh, I was raised in a Buddhist household, Jodo Shinshi Buddhist household, and we attend a lot of funerals. So I think by my 30s, I had already gone to like 100 funerals. And um, I don't think it's a morbid thing at all. I think, you know, Buddhists talk about death all the time. A reverend, 85% of their time is talking about, thinking about ceremony, ritual around death. And it is our way of talking about transformation. It's our talking, our way, it's, for me, it's my way of talking about life, living, transformation, and gratitude. Um, it keeps me really present in like, why I want to like have you all on this stage with me, right? Like be in this room right here and acknowledge. I'm going to share. There's this one. Uh, uh, there's a, a Buddhist term called gasho. So if, you, if you see someone do this, gasho. They're not praying per se. Gasho is recognizing everything that has happened in the universe to bring us all into this very moment right now. And soon, it will be gone. And soon, I won't get to see your faces, right? So I'm trying to remember you now. You know? And I will. It's going to go in my, my bones. It becomes a part of my DNA. It becomes a part of my joy. I'm thinking a lot right now about not just intergenerational trauma, but transgenerational delight. Transgenerational delight. We carry that with us, too. In the summertime, we gather around Obon. You'll see at any like Japanese American community, temple, or church in North America, uh, from the end of July well into the middle of August, there's at least two or three temples doing Obon festival. And you'll see people dancing in a circle. And we're dancing for the dead. We're dancing constantly for the dead. We're remembering. So for me, poetry is that dance. It's that way of remembering, but also being very present and knowing that I'm dancing alongside other very alive human beings and enjoying this moment. Whether or not someone is here, they're, they're, they're still with us. They're still dancing with us. You know what I mean? So. I like talking about death. I think that's, and I, I know I didn't read any death moments tonight, but I do love reading those too. Um, some of them are tied to, to, to violence, and the, the, that goes off into another direction, right? But um, yeah. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, you started touching upon like what draws you to poetry, but I am curious to hear a little bit more about that because you do so much interdisciplinary work. 
Um, so I'm curious, like, what distinguishes each discipline, mm. and what is it about poetry that might offer something that a different discipline can't? Mm. I love poetry so much. And yeah, I do. I do play and practice in many different mediums. I love, OK, so I'm a theater artist as well. And um, you know, when we travel, <laughs> oh, the last time I was here, I was mentioning this to y'all. Uh, the last time I was here at Smith College was with this theater company like 20 years ago. And um, there's like tech and lights and costumes and, you know, a, a, it's, it's great. It's a huge collaboration. Um, I love that poetry is so accessible. I love that all you really need right now is like your fingernail. I swear to God, on like the back of a brown bag, you can write a poem with your fingernail, okay? Most of us have some access to pencils and pens, so that's even better. <laughs> oh, that's all you need. You don't even need a fancy journal. I love journals. Oh my God, I have so many. I have too many, right? But you don't need that. You need like a receipt, right? The back of a receipt, right? So the accessibility of it, and, and it's interesting though, right? Within that accessibility, I, I always wonder when I'm invited to a university, am I like the only one without an MFA in your reading series? Now, it's getting more common that I go out in the past handful of years um, that there are other people who are definitely published by independent press, and I love that. But I'm telling you, 15 years ago, oh! I was such a weirdo, right? Like, they'd be like, this is the activist poet. No, 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 they weren't rude like that. But you know what I mean. There's, there's, there's often these distinctions in the literary world. People in LA have a complex because, not everybody, but there's a, there's a literary complex that people have because we're not situated in New York. Therefore, though, I invite you all to come hang out with us in LA because we have so many amazing dope poets who don't give a shit about that and are writing so fiercely, and are becoming independent publishers, or self-publishing. And that, finally, thankfully, has, has, has been losing a little bit of stigma. Not in academia world. Challenge to y'all academia people. But you know what I mean? So I, that's why I don't take this pleasure uh, lightly, because I, I, I know there's a fire in y'all about the establishment, about the institution, to invite someone like me. Um, yeah, give it up, give it up for the folks that <laughs> believe that, that poetry should be about so many things and not just um, MFAs. And I love, I, I love our MFAs. Come on, let me let me just say that too. <laughs> I'll get myself in so much trouble, right? But whatever. So <laughs> it's complex. It's complex. It's layered. And there's so much love available for everybody. And there's so much greatness for poetry to just open its doors. Because the thing is, poetry has to open its doors because there are so many young poets that break down those doors anyway. They're like, you can't tell me I can't write. I have to write to survive. I have to write this thing out of my body right now for my sanity. So you cannot tell me I don't belong in this sphere. That's what I love about poetry. Um, yeah. Thank you. OK. How are we doing on time? OK. OK, do we get to let the audience ask a question, too? If you'd like to open <laughs> it up, we can totally do that. Oh, well, I just, you know, if there's time for one, at least. But yeah. yeah. Could I do this one, and then we can open it up? Okay. <laughs> or I'll, I'll just try to make my answer shorter so you can each do yours. Go ahead, go ahead, let's do okay, it. Okay, okay. Well, I'm sorry if this is too... No, too don't, don't apologize, please. Never <laughs> with me and these things ever apologize. Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you for your last answer. And um, I, I mean, your poems just offer so much vulnerability. Um, I mean, the ones that you read today um, and all throughout the, all throughout the book. Um, and there are... But there are also like these moments that you play with punctuation and you add these white spaces that make it harder to parse. So I'm curious how you 
Um, how do you balance the openness and the vulnerability necessary to write this work with protecting and respecting the privacy, the closedness of these community-specific memories or your own knowledge? Um, and yeah, yeah, it can get very complicated, right? When you're when you, when anyone is talking about. I mean, any of these stories, because they're always tied to other people, right? Um, I always just try to be, I always ask myself, um, how honest am I being? And is this my memory of what happened, um, even if it's not my, my experience, not the actual experience of what actually happened? Because we all change what happens, what happened, right, in our memories. It's so... It's so complicated. So I have to just do the very best I can to be super centered and honest. And, and, and that's why they end up being so vulnerable because it just opens up. Um, that's, I guess that's, a really, that's, that's something I hadn't thought about too much in terms of vulnerability. This question comes up a lot, in, in that word comes up a lot. And I love it, I love vulnerability. Um, just like I love death, but you know, again, do you know? You all know what I mean. Um, I love the ways in which we can relate to those things, and what that does when we do, when we're not afraid to talk about certain things. And so, that's my guiding force. Like, do I need to say this thing even if I don't want to say it? How honest am I being? It's going to make me cry every time I read it. Doesn't matter. We should actually have an emotional charge, I believe, when we're writing. When we read something out loud, when we're workshopping a piece, and if we don't feel anything and it's all in our head and we think we're so clever, I'm not personally interested in that. I want, I'm, I'm wondering, what is the relationship here? What is the relationship between me and this memory? What's the relationship between me and this person, this friend, this movement, what I'm Asking people, what, what is my relationship between what I feel and the call to action? And also then, it makes me think about being generous. So I have a note to Nikkei community on black reparations and comfort women. It's something, especially the comfort women thing, is very difficult for Japanese American community, some, some segments of it, to talk about. But that's exactly why I felt like I had to write it. You know? But I, I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm not trying to feel like I know better than them. I'm just coming from my place of, please, can we talk about this? Can, can you consider this? Can you read this? Can you study this? So I think that when we're talking to, when we're doing direct address to certain people in our work, I, I, I like to think about, I think I come to it as an organizer. Sure, there's certain ways in which I'm going to write, and it's going to be like, F this. But a lot of it, if, if I'm really being real, if I'm really expecting to read this to an actual person that might have difficulty, then I really want to see how I challenge myself to get a question or a message across and actually bring them in. You know what I mean? So, oh my god, that wasn't short. <laughs> that was so long-winded. <laughs> Do we have time? I'm so sorry. Was that did that answer your question? Okay, 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 okay. Sorry. Let's let's do your question. Do one short. Question. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can answer your question in like ten words. Let's try that. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so this one is might be easier to answer in yeah. ten words because okay. it's it's pretty lighthearted. Um, so one of your poems in this collection is called "LA Is Such a Scorpio," and I'm sure I am particularly interested, and I'm sure people share this interest to hear more about your astrological chart, um, oh your larger God. thoughts on astrology, and whether you're particularly drawn to it or if you just think that resonates with LA. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! In ten words. <laughs> My big three, Sun sign Scorpio. Ascendant, I think, is Capricorn, but I got to look at my chart. Um, I have a lot of Sagittarius, I'll just say that. A lot of Sagittarius. I'm a lot of water and fire. Perfect. <laughs> I feel like I need more Earth. 
But that's where, where Joycey comes in. She's my earth. Um, that's probably about 10 words right there. <laughs> yeah, I don't, do we, is that good? <laughs> the reason why I'll just say this about LA being a Scorpio is because, again, people love to make assumptions about Los Angeles. I have met people in various parts of the world who um, tell me they're going to come to the West Coast, but they're going to go to San Francisco. And they've already premeditated, they've already heard through media what LA is. And I tell them it's so much more, it's so different than what they think. So I invite you all to come to LA, come to Tuesday Night Cafe. It's on the first and third Tuesday, April through October. It's free. It's for you, okay? Can, do we have time for just one from the audience? Is that, is that okay? And can we thank these such amazing facilitators of brilliant questions that I hope you'll email to me, because these are great. Does someone have a question? Ooh, right there. I think a mic is coming to you. If you could say your name and your major. Hi, my name is Tess Vujin, and I am undeclared. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe sociology. I don't know. Um, but I was just wondering, and this is probably kind of a basic question. You've probably been asked it before. But um, what piece of advice do you have for young artists um, or anybody who's really interested in exploring art seriously but doesn't really know where to start or feels a little discouraged? I, too, was undeclared until the day before I was forced to declare something. I majored in criminal justice because I, was an act I am an activist, and I thought knowing the law would be good. Um, and I wanted to study systems within law. I minored in child development and Asian American studies. And then I ran off with a theater company in my last year of college. <laughs> All this to say. Mm, what matters, right, is what you feel like burning inside of you, what you feel drawn to, and to go that way. And you mentioned it, you've been discouraged. So it could probably be a scary, a scary thought, right? That's good. If you get shaky and nervous and like you start getting those like weird chest things and you start getting heated and when you think about it, that's, that's exactly where you have to like crack it open and eventually dive. But be gentle with yourself, be kind to yourself through it and find your tribes. When you see a certain piece that you like, if you see a certain drawing, painting, Find folks, right, that also follow these artists and maybe do similar work. Do a co-working session, right? Mm, be courageous in the direction of what's drawing you. And you will find more people. Like, you have to verbalize it a little bit and look. And then you'll connect with people that have a similar draw and spend time there. Spend time in those places that showcase that kind of work. Can I ask, is there a particular medium that you're thinking about? Theater! Theater! Woo! Oh! So you can come talk to me after. I have so much more to say about that specifically. But goodness, I mean, go to a local theater company. Seek out pieces, artists that you like, go talk to them, take classes, join a theater company. Maybe don't do it the way I did it and like upset your parents too much, but if you really stick to it, they'll eventually understand, even if it takes like many years. Just kidding, I'm not giving you advice. No, don't. No, I'm not, but um, you know what I mean? I think, yeah, just if it makes you happy, if it gives you that delight, and it makes you scared, oh, what a good combo. What a good combo, okay? Please go, go in that direction. It's great. Theater needs, theater needs more people um, coming from a good place, yeah. 
Tracy, thank you. Oh, yes. Sorry, didn't mean to sneak oh. up on you. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank you again for such a truly inspiring, moving, beautiful night um, and a reading. Um, thank you again to Lila for your poems. Oh and thank God. you. Lyle's, yes. Can't wait for more of your work. And thank you again to Melissa Parrish's class for such a fabulous introduction and conversation. So can, one more round I, of applause. Can I also say thank you so much to Smith College. Thank you so much to Professor Donovan, to Professor Parrish, Jennifer Blackburn. Oh, my goodness. And Professor Chunk, who brought me, like, I think the connection in the very first place. And I do. Sh can I shout out the anthology? Yeah. Um, you should say the name of it. The Literature of Japanese American Incarceration. So fun fact, uh, I'm going to be one of the audio narrators for this anthology, and no redress will be in it. So yeah, look out for that. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thank, thank you all. Again. Thank you all so much. And Tracy will be here at the Purple Tablecloth signing books. Can we thank take a all. group picture? <laughs>